edition of the afternoon session. It's an honor to introduce Ramesh Johari from Stanford, who will talk about bandwidth learning and externalities. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Eva. Thank you to uh, Stephen and Balaji and uh, David for putting together the workshop and uh, inviting me. I'm pretty excited to talk about this work. This is actually the first talk that um, any of us is giving on this uh, work. It's relatively recent. So uh, feedback is very welcome. Uh, my collaborators on the work are Virag and Jose. Uh, Jose is sitting there. Virag, I think, was here. Oh, there he is. Um, and so yeah, um, definitely any mistakes are my own, and any credit uh, should go to the two of them. Um, so uh, the motivation for the work uh, is actually, I mean, there's two ways to look at it. So I'll, I'll kind of describe to you, first of all, what um, my own motivation was, and then maybe how this embeds within a broader context. So my own motivation, I mean, here's a, a, a wide range of online platforms. And uh, this, I've generally been quite interested in thinking about the design and operation of these platforms over the last seven years or so. Uh, and one of the things that I, I kind of find interesting is that usually these um, platforms will use various types of learning algorithms to determine how to recommend items or um, you know, jobs or uh, alternatives to users. And um, you know, these algorithms, the, the way that they're usually developed, at least to the extent that one can prove anything about them, the, the, uh, the types of guarantees we provide are typically under the presumption that the arrivals are not influenced by the decisions that you make. And in many of these platforms, that turns out to be a pretty poor assumption, um, which is, you know, that one of the things that is, is fairly common, especially for platforms that maybe are, are in an earlier middle stage of their life cycle, is that um, positive experiences by certain types of users will tend to attract more users of the same type. Um, it's very common if you're talking to, you know, especially kind of folks in industry that, that work around these platforms, that these sorts of network effects in the population that they're trying to attract um, are one of the big things that they think about strategically. Now, we titled the talk Bandit Learning with Positive Externalities. Um, I didn't want to use the phrase network effects because there's no network in the talk per se. I think Asu's talk is much more a talk about network games. Um, this is so, so I, I use the phrase positive externalities to refer to this kind of positive reinforcing uh, behavior. So that was my, you know, that, that was kind of the more applied motivation for it. Now, in terms of like the context it sits within, one of the things I find interesting about this, and I think that that might be a launching point to think about other types of problems that are related, is that is really this point that arrivals are not influenced by decisions. Because if you take this to its extreme, and you take you know typical multi-arm bandit problems, and then change the feature that the arrival process is sort of independent of the decisions you're making, you basically are, in the worst case, you're kind of all the way over to full reinforcement learning. Because now the actions you're taking are influenced what's happening in the future, so there's delayed consequences. And um, you know, to make progress in this type of a problem, you need, I think, uh, some type of structure if you want to give kind of sharp guarantees. So this is a nice kind of um, you know, mathematical model where there's enough structure to be able to say something very precise. Okay, so those are kind of two different ways to situate what the work is all about. So um, the first two slides here, I'm just going to set up for you what one of the main points of the talk is with a very, very simple example that illustrates kind of how positive externalities play a role in the analysis that we do. So suppose there's two types of users. Blue users like blue items, but not red items. And red users like red items, but not blue items. OK? Um, and you know, in a nutshell, if you ask yourself what could go wrong, in using a typical learning algorithm that kind of is ignoring this self-reinforcement effect. Um, here are the basic issues. So if you make a red-red match early on, let's say, then there are two things that happen. There's kind of two effects that simultaneously will start to play out as a consequence of that effect, of that match. Um, and I, actually, sorry, this should have said, suppose a successful red-red match is made early on. Okay, So when I say red-red match, you can imagine there's some stochasticity in the outcome. You know, just assume this was a good match. OK, now the first thing is the positive externality says that when red type uh, users have good experiences, that tends to attract more users of the same type in the future. So that will mean that more red type users are likely to arrive because of this single event. But the other thing that happens is that um, because more of these users are arriving, should the platform choose to show blue items, it will generate less reward on those choices, on those, on those instances. OK? So, Essentially, both of these, you know, these, these kind of phenomena, what they do is they push the platform in the direction of preferring red-red matches. Okay? And this is you know, very kind of high level and hand wavy. And you could, you know, it begs a lot of questions, which is, well, OK, yes, this is 
obviously structured to make a particular point. Does this really matter? Is this a thing that anyone should actually worry about? And this was, you know, for Jose and Virag and I, this was kind of the launching point of asking, well, is there, is there something here? You know, I mean, obviously, one answer to this might be yes. In principle, this could happen, but it's actually not interesting. Now, since I still have like 25 minutes left, you know, something must have happened, uh, and that's that's what I'll tell you about over the rest of the talk. Okay. Um, so yeah, and and just to just to emphasize, in the case where in fact blue blue matches are more valuable to the platform, this would be a suboptimal outcome from the perspective of reward. Um, just one thing I'll mention before I go away from the motivation, because the rest of the talk will really just be in the kind of mathematical model setting. Uh, I, one of the reasons I find this model fascinating is it is a good prompt for lots of other conversations. I mean, just making a statement like this already forecasts that I'm going to care about the platform maximizing reward. Um, but you can see that this setup and this kind of self-reinforcement in who is seeing what is very closely related to much of the discussion on polarization and those types of dynamics. And so you could think of other objective functions that might be interesting here as well um, from the perspective of learning none of what I'm doing in this talk. So in that sense, that's you know, again why I feel like it's really the tip of a much larger iceberg of how these self-reinforcing processes influence learning. Okay, so here's the summary of our results. Basically just two main things I'm going to tell you, although you'll see that um, th it breaks down into many, many uh, uh, smaller results along the way. Um, one of them is that optimal algorithms for the standard multi-arm bandit can fail spectacularly. So the first answer that I'm giving you here is yes, the thing I told you in the last two slides actually is a problem and it can happen, but the other is I'll fill in for you what I mean by spectacularly as we, as we go along. And then, you know, given that that's the case, that begs the question also, what, what would a good algorithm look like? And we basically characterize a, a good algorithm and a matching lower bound, okay? All right, so what is the model? The model is uh, a fairly straightforward generalization of what I showed you in that, in that simple example, and so let me fill that in. Um, we'll start with all the stuff that's classical. So everything that, that you would write down for a standard multi-arm bandit problem. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm very grateful to the speakers who came before me this week, um, Rahul in particular, Rahul Jain on Monday. Uh, there was plenty of discussion of multi-arm bandits, so I'm kind of presuming that you know, some of that is already background at this point. So um, M is the number of arms. Uh, T is a discrete time horizon where I'm gonna assume that one user is arriving per time step that I can take an action on. Mu A is the probability of unit reward when arm A is pulled. Um, and, and basically I'm thinking of this as then a Bernoulli outcome. It's a, um, it's a, uh, um, it's a, a zero one reward that I get when I pull an arm. Um, I want you to, to pause on this for a second. I, I specifically wrote standard bandit here because this is what we mean in the standard bandit model. Um, I'm obviously gonna have to tell you a little bit more about this when we think about positive externalities. That'll be the next slide. Okay, um, A star is gonna denote the best arm. For simplicity, we'll assume it's unique. That's not really that consequential. And then two additional pieces of notation that denote the number of, uh, there's a spider that's actually walking down my slide as I go. Um, so, so TA of T is the number of times that arm A is pulled or recommended up to time T. So think of these arms as items. Think of pulling as recommendation. And then SA of T is the number of times that I actually get a reward on arm A, okay? Crucially, the platform, of course, doesn't, um, uh, you know, it, it's, its goal is going to be to think about uh, maximizing its expected reward, as I, as I hinted at earlier, um, over that time horizon. And then all of our analysis is done asymptotic in T, so we're not providing finite time bounds here, okay? All right. Oh, and I guess uh, one other comment I should make is the, just because of time, um, I'm not really saying anything about related work. Uh, we have an archive paper up. There's lots of different connections from this type of work to you know, particularly the literature on network effects and the literature on bandit learning. Um, and uh, you know, I'm happy to, to talk more about that offline if you'd like. Okay, so um, what is the model of positive externalities? Uh, what we do is we first assume that there's initial bias on each arm, that's theta A. Okay, and you assume that all, all of these are strictly uh, positive. Um, and then what we assume is that the user arriving at time t likes an arm A with a probability which is proportional to some function that depends on that initial bias and the number of, uh, the, the total rewards that you've earned on that arm up to this time. Okay, so this is that element of self-reinforcement. If people, you know, if, if arm A has generated positive rewards, then people who arrive subsequently are more likely to like arm A. Now what does like mean? I need to translate that into the preferences of this person and how that influences the bandit. So here's the key. The idea is that if a user likes arm A, all right, um, then I kind of have the standard bandit model. Mu A is the probability of generating a reward when I pull arm A for this user. The, the difference is what if this user does not like arm A? In that case, I get nothing when I pull arm A, okay? 
So there's two ways that an ARM can fail here. One way is that the user simply doesn't like the ARM. All right? And then the other way that the RMA can fail is that the user does like the ARM, but it happened to be one of those cases where randomly you just didn't get a reward. Right? So the second of those is the thing that looks like the standard bandit model, and that first one is the positive externality effect. Yeah? So one positive externality uh, with bad experience is simply no one comes. You yeah. appear to have a fixed arrival. Right. Like you're not, you're not yeah, this is a great question. I was actually about to talk about a couple of assumptions that are baked into this that are not explicit. So this is a good one. No, no, it's good that you asked that question. Um, let me talk about a simpler one first, and I'll come back to this real quick. So um, one thing I wanted to point out is that the way this is set up, it's, if you think about what this means, it means the expected number of arms preferred by a user is one. Okay? And that's just sort of a feature of this normalization. You could start thinking about other positive externality models that would sort of depart from that. So now Ava's question is a great one, and I'm going to reframe it slightly. Um, there's kind of built into this whole thing a capacity constraint, right? Which is basically that users arriving sequentially every period. And as she pointed out, um, in, our, in our model, we're not kind of allowing the possibility that the rate of user arrival slows down or speeds up. Um, and you know, in some sense, there's, the platform knows for sure it's going to have T service opportunities. It's not going to have any more than that, and it's not going to have any less than that. Okay? And both directions, I think, are interesting to think about. So the capacity constraint is really interesting because that's one of the things that drives trying to find the best arm in the first place. And then in the other direction, what you said is really interesting because that might mean that despite having T service opportunities, I actually can't take advantage of all of them because I've driven people away. Um, so yeah, I think those are certainly important ways in which our model is stylized. Okay? All right. Um, so f is what I'm going to call the externality function. It determines the strength of this positive externality. Right? Uh, and you know, for basically everything I do up until the last couple slides of the talk, I'm going to assume that f is just x, just linear. In general, we consider f's that are x to the alpha with the exception of one result where I'll, I'll mention to you that holds for more general f. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So um, since I'm studying performance that's asymptotic in T, uh, you know, it's, it's natural basically to think of a baseline oracle where I'm always choosing RMA star. Now this clearly may not be optimal on finite time horizons, right, because of the bias. I mean, if the bias is really, really strong in a direction away from A star and T is very small, I know I shouldn't pull A star. But asymptotically, at least, it seems plausible that A star, pull, always pulling A star asymptotically would be the right thing to do because you can move the population over to, to liking A star. Um, and so we, we just, as a result, use this as our, as our baseline, and all our comparisons are with respect to this baseline. So one of the things I have to do before I do anything else is actually just show you what the, you know, what the payoff of this baseline looks like. And what you can show is it looks like mu star, mu a star times t, which is like you know, the expected linear reward you would get if everybody liked a star when they arrived, minus some cost, which is due to the fact that there's this initial bias. So you're waiting for the population to move over to liking a star. Okay. Um, and the rough idea is that, you know, where does this log t come from? And I'm telling you this because it'll play a role later. Um, the idea here is that at each time t, when you're always pulling a star, the probability the arriving user likes a star is going to look like this. And what's important in this is that you have a 1 over t in the second term. Okay? Um, it'll also be important that there's this sum of theta a in the numerator, but I'll explain that to you as, as, as it matters. Right? Um, so that's, that's where the log t is coming from here, is simply that I have to sum over this 1 over t. Okay, and so what we're going to do is measure our regret of any algorithm that I choose to tell you about um, by measuring performance against this Oracle baseline. Okay, notably, um, on any finite t, it's actually possible this is negative, right? Because this is not necessarily optimal for finite t. Asymptotically, this should not be negative. Okay. All right, so um, let's talk about you know, this, uh, this result on, on standard bandit learning and what that tells us. So I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Um, the UCB algorithm is this uh, you know, standard benchmark algorithm. You've heard about it a few times now. Um, you know, basically, the idea is that I pull the arm that has the largest empirical mean reward plus some expansion on, on that estimate, uh, which is this upper confidence bound. And the idea in the upper, upper confidence bound is that it's, I have two terms that are growing here in principle, one which is log t and the other which is the number of times I've pulled arm a. And the idea behind this ratio is that what I'm trying to do is exactly balance the, the change in the upper confidence bound to make sure I never incur, incur regret more than log t. 
Okay, so this is actually a finite time optimal algorithm. That's the, that's the result of our et al for, for this algorithm. Okay? And that's the well-known fact for the standard multi-arm bandit is that you get a regret of order log t, and that's in fact the best you can do. Okay, so what happens for this kind of bandit algorithm with positive externalities? As I already mentioned to you, that red-blue example suggests there's at least a possibility something could go wrong. Um, now, how severe is that? So it turns out to be actually quite bad. We show that UCB has linear expected regret. Okay, so that's basically about as bad as you could do. Doing nothing would give you linear expected regret. Right? Um, but in fact, the situation is much worse than that, if, if you can believe that. <laughs> so um, the sense in which the situation is worse, let me parse this for you. Um, so what I'm asking here is, what is the probability that my algorithm never sees a reward when it pulls A star? Okay? And so if you think about what this is going to look like as t gets larger, right? The probability of never seeing a reward when I pull a star should get smaller, because t is longer now. But nevertheless, it remains bounded away from zero. And so what this is saying is that there's a positive probability of never receiving a reward on arm a star with the UCB algorithm. And um, this is actually the one result that holds fairly strongly. It will actually hold for any super logarithmic externality function f. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. So his question was, um, can I do a warm start for UCB um, to sample enough from each arm? And let me come back to that. So you're going to see that this idea of balancing turns out to be quite important. Um, in fact, that's the whole, uh, that's the whole solution uh, to, to kind of forecast ahead a little bit. So if you were to do that, the fact that you were using UCB afterwards wouldn't matter much anymore. The important thing is to figure out how are you going to do that kind of uh, um, balanced exploration early on. So I'll talk about that a little bit. But yeah, here I'm not doing anything particularly special early on. Okay, and so um, if you ask yourself, like, why does UCB fail, and, and the intuition is really given by that early example with red and blue type users, the issue is that uh, it, you know, and uh, like we can't blame the algorithm. That's not as if it's co coded in the algorithm anyway. But there's no way for it to know that part of what's happening here is that the people who are showing up just don't like the arms that it's trying out. So it didn't even have the chance to see what mu a might have been, all right? And if it ignores that fact, then it's going to stop exploring too quickly on arms that actually might have been useful. Um, so you know, what's a simple benchmark that explores a bit more? So I'm, I'm only, you'll see why I'm including this here. This actually is, is kind of a waypoint on the way to talking about what a good algorithm might be. Um, what's a simple benchmark that explores more? Um, so let's just talk about a very, very simple way to, to, um, to, uh, um, to, to kind of uh, balance our exploration out, kind of along the lines of this question about warm starting. And so what we could do is explore uniformly at random for fixed time t, and then commit to the empirical best arm at tau for the rest of the horizon. Okay? Um, and this is basically what's called random explore than exploit, um, also stud well studied and also gives log t regret for the standard bandit if you optimize tau. So this actually turns out to be somewhat better than UCB if you optimize it. You get uh, t to the c regret where c is less than 1. Okay? So at least it's not linear regret. But nevertheless, we're not, you know, the question remains, is this the best you can do? Um, one of the reasons I wanted to just tell you about this uh, is simply because this is a, a great Stochastic Networks audience. Um, when you're using REE, what's really nice is that you can map the analysis over to the analysis of generalized uh, earned processes. So basically the idea is that you model every single arm through a continuous time branching process um, where branches are occurring at rate 1 over m. And essentially what happens every time there's a branching is that you either go down, you, you either stay where you are if you didn't get a success, or you go up to uh, 2 because you, because you, you got a success and this, this uh, increases the positive externality. Remember that I'm working with the linear externality function. Um, what's really nice about this embedding is that if you now look at the jump chain of the combined process, um, the behavior of the jump chain exactly accounts for network effects. Okay, it exactly accounts for kind of what the, what the um, cumulative rewards on the different uh, arms look like. So this is kind of a nice piece of analysis uh, that you can see in the paper. Okay? And partly it's also here for narrative purposes, which is that this was like the second step in what we tried to do when we analyzed this problem. So we started with UCB. We realized it can fail really badly. Then you think about this, and you're like, well, this is better. And then you ask yourself, okay, can, you know, how much better can things be? And so um, an optimal algorithm all right, clearly needs to think about this possibility that one of the reasons I'm not identifying the optimal arm is that I just didn't have a chance to observe a reward, that whoever was arriving was not actually someone who liked, uh, liked that arm. 
And so you know, that was the issue with UCB. If you don't explore enough, then you risk missing the optimal arm entirely simply because arriving users don't like it. Now, when we explore at random, okay, um, perhaps we do a slightly better job identifying the optimal arm. That's why the regret is lower. It doesn't scale linearly with T. Okay? Um, but too much regret is incurred undoing the bias that was created now on suboptimal arms. Right? So this is what is, is kind of neat about the model is that the positive externality uh, in order to learn about an arm, you're going to be attracting users of that type to the platform, and that is going to create a bias you might have to undo later once you figure out what the best arm actually is. Okay? And so what we wanted to do is you know, develop an algorithm that sort of structures its exploration more intelligently to overcome these challenges. All right? And that's, that's what I'll tell you about next. Okay, so the balanced exploration algorithm, which is actually you know, a very, very simple idea, is um, then what you do is you fix a tau that looks like theta log t. And uh, for t less than that tau, you pull the arm with the lowest cumulative reward, okay, lowest SA. Um, and what this is doing is it's, a, it's essentially trying to make sure that you're giving every arm ample opportunity to earn reward. So to your question about warm starting, you need to warm start in some way, but it has to be sort of structured. And, and so this, is, this turns out to be the right structure because this is the thing that's ensuring that, um, that all arms, independent of whether they're optimal or not, at least having a chance to generate rewards. Okay? And this is the, the thing I can observe that's telling me whether or not um, I'm seeing enough users who actually uh, like that arm. And then after that, I do kind of the obvious thing. I pull the arm with, uh, with the highest mean reward at that time, just the empirical best arm. You could do something more intelligent here if you wanted to, but it, 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 you know, that doesn't end up mattering much. For, at least for the regret bounds we prove are all order in T. Okay? And so, um, what we prove is that this algorithm actually has regret order log squared t. And I want to tell you a little bit about where that comes from. The easiest way to convince you of where that comes from is actually to tell you about the lower bound. Yeah? It's t sub a. Sorry. I... Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I should have explained. Okay. SA is the total number of rewards I've earned up to time t. And then this is, sorry, this is the total number of times I've pulled the arm up to time t. Okay. So when I take this ratio, that's like the empirical estimate of, of that arm. Yeah? So what's it hidden in your big O notation? is the ratio of the different views. Yeah, that's and true. One view is significantly worse than another. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. It's a long time before you yeah. have Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. So uh, that's something we've thought about um, that you know is kind of one of the strange things about this exploration procedure. Like you almost never see in a good banded algorithm, something that looks like that. <laughs> um, but I, you know, that's part of what makes it interesting. So I think that what's happening in the feedback structure here is um, the, the trade-off for the platform is going to be between, it's kind of like choosing failure, right? So when, when am I willing to give up that it's not worth observing more from a particular population? Um, so if you got down to the level of worrying about what the, uh, you know, what the actual uh, arm parameters were, so trying to characterize these bounds using actually like distribution dependent constants, then that would have to play a role in the algorithm. And so yeah, by sweeping it under the rug, we're kind of able to avoid that. One thing we did do um, that's, it's, it's not answering your question by any means, but at least from, a, from the perspective of refining the bounds, we, we have been able to extend the bounds to at least capture dependence on the number of arms, um, but not in terms of uh, the actual distribution. Yeah. So all this is for a fixed t. Yes. What can you say about the more general case where this is ongoing? Yeah, you're right. So this is fixed t and then asymptotic in t as opposed to something that's ongoing. Um, that's a great question. So the, I have like, I'm of two minds about this. I mean, uh, you know, that I, I feel like the right way to think about that question probably is to pop back to the platform context and ask the kind of question that Eva brought up. Where, I mean, if you really wanted to talk about endogeneity of the user population, for most platforms, there's this dichotomy between growing and succeeding and failing completely. And so really the only two possible outcomes are something where you die completely or you've actually succeeded and you're stable. And I think it would be probably you know, more valuable to think about this, you know, this sort of, can you hit uh, this, this exponential growth that gets you out of, out of being stable? And that would, of course, look very different than what we're doing here. It all comes back to this issue of this capacity constraint, sort of the T is, T is both fixing, I can't get more or less than that, right? And um, you know, when, we, when we've talked about this, this is one of the things that we're, it, it's actually challenging to figure out how you would model that in a way that you can, you can still get, uh, get, a, um, get good learning guarantees. Yeah, that's a great question. You're going to notice this recurrent theme that I don't have answers to any of your questions uh, because this is you know, still relatively new work. But I'm trying to answer other questions. So, OK, thanks, everyone. OK, so oh, was there another question? Yeah. yeah so what did you 
have a very bad, bad arm that never generate any reward. Yeah, that's what Eva was asking, exactly. So because of this, right? I mean, essentially what this is doing. So, so to be pedantic about it, right? The, the, the whole idea behind the algorithm is what's, what's causing the problem? The problem is I, can't, I don't know for sure that the reason an arm failed is, is that um, you know, I tried it and that person actually liked it and I got a zero reward. Or I tried it and the person just never liked it in the first place. And so um, you know, one of the issues with this is that um, like, in order for you to know that at least this person liked the arm, the only feedback you're ever going to get that's going to tell you that is actually getting a reward. And that's basically why this is the thing that you have to balance exploration on. Now, coming back to Ava's point and, and your point, right? I mean, a very simple thing that you could do, if, you, if let's say you had a lower bound and you said, I'm never going to be interested in any MUA that's below this bound, that I think would be fairly easy to incorporate. Because that kind of thing, you could just say, well, you know, essentially, once you're certain that MUA is below, you just stop exploring on that arm. Um, I think what's more interesting is to make that trade off a bit more dynamic because that still presumes that you have this ex ante understanding of what a lower bound on MUA looks like. It'd be nicer to have an algorithm that's responsive to the actual distributions that are present without having to know them in advance. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, four times da. So, uh, if one were to pick the arm, the lowest mean reward? Yeah. Reward? Pick the arm with the lowest mean reward. Four times da. So, you have yeah. lowest. Yeah. So let's say that oh, pick the lowest mean reward. Um, that's a good question. Let me think. Um, my hunch is no, but I want to think it over. I, actually, yeah. So, lo locally, I think it would be okay, but I'm not. I don't. I'd have to think through the consequences from the positive externality perspective. So let's come back to that. Maybe we can talk about it offline. That's a good question, actually. Um, I just want to work through the lower bound because I only have at this point two minutes left. Okay. Um, so lower bound matches. It's log squared t as well. And I'll quickly give you what the intuition for the lower bound is, OK? So basically the idea, and let me click through it. So basically the idea is that um, you know, as is typical in these bandit lower bounds, you have to get to the point where you explored enough on every arm, all right? And um, I want to remind you of this formula, which says that you know, the probability that a user likes a star uh, is going to look like this if you happen to be always pulling a star. Right? Now what this means is, let's say that from this time theta tau onwards, um, you correctly identified a star. Or from time tau onwards, you correctly identified a star. Then what this is telling you is that you're going to incur regret that looks like omega of tau log t. And the reason is that you've got the 1 over t still here. And now instead of this bias in the numerator, you've got a bias that comes from having seen enough successes on all the other arms. OK? Um, so you know that you're going to get tau log t. And then the last piece of this is very similar to standard bandit lower bounds, where the point is that you can't get away with getting something than, than um, O log t exploration on every arm, because otherwise you don't know. Uh, so you can use a change of measure argument to argue that, well, if you explore less than log t, then you would incur very high regret in an alternate universe where the arm rewards were switched around. Right? And so that means that this has to look like log t, the tau. And if you put log t into there, then you get log squared t. That's a rough idea of the lower bound. OK, and so um, I'll just wrap up by talking about the, do I have one more minute, Eva? OK. Um, I just want to wrap up by talking about what happens as you vary positive externalities. And this is sort of the full picture. UCB always gives you linear regret, right? Um, in the case where there's no positive externalities, it actually looks exactly like a standard bandit problem with all the rewards scaled down by 1 over m. And so this is why you see log t everywhere here, all right? And so I'll just point out two interesting things about this table. One is that it's actually discontinuous at alpha equals 0 and alpha equals 1. And the reason for this is that the, the zero boundary is where you go from no positive externality to having a positive externality. This, you know, since everything is order in t, this completely changes the behavior of, of, the, of the bounds. And then the other piece of it, why does it inflect at alpha equals 1? This is because of that 1 over t in the, in the summation of 1 over t. So alpha equals 1 is exactly the point where you go from summable to not summable. Right, and that's, that's kind of the other piece that, that causes uh, discontinuity in what the bounds look like. Um, but those are kind of the main pieces. And in particular, the, the last thing I'll say on the slide is that balanced exploration is something which achieves the lower bound. But importantly, the algorithm itself doesn't need to know what alpha was. Okay, so the thing it's taking advantage of is that there are positive externalities, but it's not using information about what the strength of those positive externalities were. Okay. All right, so I'll wrap up there. I'll just leave this slide up. Thank you.
Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, so I, I said, I said that uh, all the theta is are strictly positive. There's a finite number, so. Yeah. Oh, do you mean you mean in the lower bound proof or? So, oh, you mean on mu a, not on theta a? Sorry, on the on the yeah, and that I yeah, that's right. I think I didn't say this on the slide. I'm assuming all the mu a's are strictly positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. If there were two algorithms that were running this geometry, and the set of users was fixed across both of these, do you expect that they would share the uh, highest utility users equally, or would they would just like bifurcate? Like they would say, okay, you pick this group, I pick the other group. So that is, I think that's a great question, and that's that is exactly the type of thing that I'm hoping this can like start to prompt. So I mean, essentially, your question is, if you have competing platforms, do they end up segmenting the population or? Yeah, and. Um, I don't, I, I don't have any intuition for that off the top of my head. Yeah. I can imagine that could go many different ways depending on the strength of the externality. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up there. Thank you. special present for you. Oh. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. And the speaker is Raja Gopal from Stanford. In one more second, he'll start speaking. Thank you. Wrong. Okay, so I think this is on. No, it's on. We don't need it. We need it ah. to record it. Okay. So.